So shall we uh, wrap up a little bit uh, all the things we have uh, done over the past four days, um, nine days or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, if you want we can make it very informal, yeah, you can just uh, ask questions whenever you like and we can kind of, you know, do whatever you want. This is kind of coming to the very end now, so we can really kind of take a more a really super duper relaxed <laughs> attitude, which is nice. So please feel free to do. Does anyone have any questions or specific things you want to bring up uh, at the very beginning here? Uh, is everyone okay? Uh, so please feel free to ask as we as we go along. Yes, Guan Yin. Yes. Um, just to confirm your SN twelve fifteen Kachana Gota Sutta. Ah yeah. You were saying that you confirmed the Yebu Yena as by attraction, grasping and insisting, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was what we're talking about. Yeah, that was Thank the main you. thing. Yeah, and also middle way. It was middle way. It's by the middle at the very end. Yeah, that's the other one. So those two are things I was confirming here. Yeah, so the Kachana Gotta Sutta. <coughs> so, um, sorry, Ajahn. Yeah, please, absolutely, go for it. Uh, I have a question about stream entry. Yeah. So, for someone who is on the path but has not attained the fruit of Sotapanna, hmm. is there a possibility for a person to drop away from the path? Uh, I don't think so. It's. I think it specifically says in the soon as that if you are on the path, it actually this idea of path is actually a commentarial notion, but if you are um, uh, sotapati pali, satsakirya patipano, some, someone who is practicing for the fruit of the attainment of stream entry, it's a very long expression used in the suttas, uh, you have to become a stream entry within that life. Yeah, so having the path means that before you die, or at the very least on your deathbed, you will become a stream entry. Uh, and so no chance. Yeah, that's it. Irreversible. If you don't want to go, then it's too late. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and I think every, all of those, because there, f there always had to be eight noble ones, four pairs, I think each one of those is a similar kind of category. Path means that you will reach the fruit of that particular attainment before you die. Yeah. So if you're on the path of once returning, then when you die you become a once returner. Yeah. Non-returning, the same. Yeah. I think that's how it works. It's just a little bit of guesswork because it doesn't say specifically, but that seems to be how it is. Uh, and the uh, commentarial notion of uh, one happening one mind moment before the other one, there is no, nothing about that in the suttas. That's a very strange, strange idea. Mm. Okay. So, uh, anything else? Yeah, please, fire away here. Yeah. Jan, I have um, two questions, which is, a, uh, it may be very simple, but I get asked by my Christian friends a lot, uh -huh. and I find it a little bit hard to explain to them. Okay. Um, we all know, like, Prince Siddhartha gave up his princely world to become a monk, yeah. and then to enlightenment. So, the question posed to me was, isn't it a little bit res irresponsible <laughs> for someone to... <laughs> ignore his family just yeah. to seek his own um, happiness <laughs> okay and the other question is yeah. um, uh, we are all responsible for our own actions hence the karma and all yeah so in that sense when you have good karma you will get a better reward um, like being a richer family and whatnot yeah so does it by proxy means that um, a person who has accumulated a lot of good karma, yeah. i.e. only rich people like the prince and all could actually attain enlightenment and the poor will have to slowly climb their way closer and closer to uh, Nibbana. Mm. Um, okay, so the, the first question is actually quite easy to answer because that story is wrong. Yeah? That's basically the answer. <laughs> That story is a story found in later Buddhism, it's the kind of the artificial story of the Buddha. If you read what happens in the suttas, actually it's quite different. In the suttas it says that the Buddha did not just leave his family behind. Uh, he says there that it, when he said to his parents he wanted to go forth, they kind of were sad, they were, were cried and they were really sad about it. 
and then they left. He didn't leave in the middle of the night, just disappearing. That's just a story. Yeah. So the reality is that he had spoken to his family, yeah, and he had kind of made it clear, this is what I want to do, uh, and obviously it had been accepted. Uh, that's why he was able to go forth. Uh, so they had had a discussion about it, uh, his wife and children, obviously they were looked, or child, they were looked after because he, he grew up in a wealthy family, there was no problem with looking after them, so they had come to an agreement that that was acceptable. Uh, yeah, so that wasn't really, uh, and this was just the way things were in India at that time. If you wanted to go forth like that, and you had the agreement of your family, that was what people would do. Uh, yeah, that was kind of fine. But the story that you know he just leaves in the middle of the night and kind of leaves them by themselves, that is does sound irresponsible. Uh, yeah, that whole story sounds bad. Uh, but if you kind of everyone is in on it and everyone has agreed, I don't, I don't think there is a problem here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that that is the first point, and uh, so uh, it's not as bad as it may seem. And this is interesting because this again shows you that so much of what people think they know about Buddhism actually is not from the word of the Buddha. It's from all kind of later sources and all kind of weird, weird, weird stuff. Uh. So the idea about being wealthy and having good karma. Well, it depends. You see, the problem is that when you make karma, it depends what your what you want to get out of it. Uh. Yeah, so if you are really greedy and you kind of do good things, yeah, okay, then maybe in the future life you will get a big house and you will be wealthy and all of that. Uh, but to really to make good karma for it to be effective on the spiritual path, uh, you should make karma in such a way that you really uh, invest it to give you a happy mind uh, instead of actually giving you a big house. Sometimes you can have both. You can have both a big house and a happy mind, but not all the wealthy people are happy here. Yeah? Some are miserable, yeah? So they have kind of reaped one aspect of good karma, but not another one. Yeah? So the intention should always be, when I do good karma, the intention should be, I do this for the purity of my mind and for the beauty of my heart, so as to progress the spiritual path. Yeah? That should be the main act, yeah? and not just do things out of a kind of purely materialistic desire for the future. Yeah? So this is what you can do if you really do things with a pure heart, just doing acts of kindness, you feel happy about yourself. That is the spiritual progress, that's where it lies. Uh, the spiritual progress does not lie in just acquiring material things, that's kind of irrelevant, completely beside the path. Uh, so it's how you, what your intention is, uh, how that karma kind of uh, materializes in the future will depend a lot on your intention at that particular time, uh, and how you, how you think about things. Uh. So, uh, a wealthy person is closer to Nibbana? Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. Okay. Anything else uh, people like to bring up? Uh, no? Uh, okay, let's just uh, uh, summarize a little bit, because uh, it's nice to summarize. Uh, this is one of the things the Buddha always does. Uh, in the suttas it gives a summary first, and it gives an exposition afterwards. Uh, uh, the summary is called the Udesa, exposition is called the Vibhanga. So Vibhanga and Udesa is what the Buddha gives. Uh, and uh, so, four noble truths, yeah? First noble truth, noble truth of suffering. And we looked at that in quite a lot of detail. Uh, and the purpose of looking at the first noble truth is simply to remind you of the reality of life. It's a way of having right view about what the world actually is like. Uh, because we tend to forget about the realities of life, uh, tend to forget about the illnesses, the old ages and the deaths in particular. Uh, and when we remember these things, it clears out some of the intoxication, clears out some of the distortion in the mind to make it more clear what really matters. Uh, and that is the point of this kind of reflection, yeah? to come back to the fundamental things of life that are really, really important. Uh, and also the idea that you are always united with things you don't like, separated from the things you like, you can't really have what you want all the time, it's a similar kind of thing. Uh, it's a reminder of the realities of existence. Uh, and that is really the point. It clears up the kind of the fog and the stupidity in people's minds a little bit, uh, and then it guides you on the right track. That is the purpose of that. And then you see where that takes you, slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah? This is an important part of it. And then there's the whole rebirth aspect, the samsaric aspect, uh, whereby you go round and round and round. And this is kind of the most scary aspect of uh, the 
Buddhist idea that we kind of go around and we don't know where we're going to get reborn next time. Uh, don't know whether we're going to be in a happy in a bad location. This is more, more faith-based or confidence-based because you can't see it directly. That's why the contemplation on death and these things is more often more powerful because we can understand that, we can relate to that. But samsara in a bigger way is, okay, you may have faith in it, uh, but it's a bit more difficult to really fully grasp what that is all about. Uh, so very useful to remember, uh, be clear about life. Yeah? The clearer we are about what life is like, the more we tend towards the spiritual practice, towards long-term benefits uh, and forgetting about the short-term benefits. Really, the worldly life is a life where we uh, give up the long-term for the short-term. That's what worldly life is like. Spiritual life is where we don't worry so much about the short-term, but we think more long-term. It's like, again, wise invest investment, investing in a wise way, uh, whereby we think of long-term success rather than short-term success. Uh, so, um, uh, please contemplate that. It is a very important part of uh, what this is all about. Uh, and uh, then, when it comes to the second noble truth, uh, yeah, the cause of dukkha, it is important to remember that the cause of dukkha, tanha, really is about the idea how tanha creates rebirth in the future. It is not so much that craving is suffering in, in and of itself, which it is, because that is already covered by the first noble truth, but it's the fact that it creates this continued existence. It carries, carries you on, drags you on. And we looked at the idea of dependent origination, how that perpetuates yeah, this rebirth process, how it goes on and on and on by projecting yourself into the future. Whenever you desire something in the future, it's like you are moving yourself into that future. And that's why the process carries on. It doesn't stop when you die. Yeah. And then the opposite happens when you give up the craving. Yeah. When you give up the craving, yeah, then, of course, you're no longer projecting yourself into the future. Yeah. When a consciousness comes to the end of life because there's no projection into the future, it just stops right there. Yeah. And that is kind of the end. So those are the first three noble truths uh, in, uh, in very, very brief, yeah, what they are about. We've been talking about this for days and days, and that is kind of a super-duper short summary, but that's, that's kind of nice. So let's talk about the path a little bit more, because that was specifically what this question was about, that someone missed out, the fourth noble truth uh, about the uh, spiritual path, because this in many ways is uh, the most interesting thing, yeah? What we should be doing, how we should live our lives. Uh, this is what really, really matters at the end of the day here. Yeah? And uh, so the fourth noble truth is defined in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? Noble Eightfold Path has how many factors? Uh, eight factors, yes. <laughs> Well done, okay. So you have, really, you have been listening very well, so you know, you know how many factors the Noble Eightfold Path has. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and these factors, w w some of the important things to remember about these factors is that they are, they condition each other. They're not individual things that stand alone, but they all relate to each other, yeah? So when you have the first factor, which is the right view, the second one tends to arise. When you have the second one, the third one comes. So this whole path is a conditioned process. So what that means is that if the whole thing is a conditioned process which rolls onwards, uh, it means the first and the last factors uh, are the most important ones because they, if you have the first factor in place, the whole thing tends to come and happen on its own. Yeah, it just because the first one leads to the second one and it goes like that from one on to the next one. Uh, so in many ways, right view is the most important factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, this is, I think, something people maybe often don't get. And this is why it is so useful to discuss right view, to remember where real contentment and happiness is to be had in the world, where problems are to be had. Uh, how, you know, this idea of rebirth and karma, all of these things kind of come together in that. Uh, what, you know, and also how to deal with these issues and problems. Uh, all of these things can be regarded as aspects of right view. But in the final analysis, uh, right view is the whole Pali canon, yeah? 
basically is one big chunk of right view right there. 5,000 pages of right view here. Yeah, except for the later kind of additions, occasion later additions or, and problems we have been talking about, it's basically all right view. So if you want right view, come back to the Pali Canon. Read what the Buddha had to say. Yeah? And uh, if you find it hard to read for yourself, you can find good explanations of suttas online or even in courses like this. I, I hope I have given reasonably good um, explanations. I cannot guarantee everything I've said is absolutely true. Sometimes you slip up, maybe you make mistakes. But I do believe I've given you a fair overview of what's true. Yeah, Don't trust me, of course, by all means, don't trust me. Because if you trust me too much, uh, then you might you might go wrong. Yeah, I'm not the Buddha. I'm just trying to repeat the word of the Buddha. So listen to what I have to say, but don't take it too super duper seriously. Think for yourself. So much of this path is about reflecting on these things and thinking about them yourself. Then they become really powerful. Then they become real for you. When they become real for you, then they become something very powerful in your life. You think, this relates to me. This is me. Cheaper, this is true. And then that emotion is what drives you. Human beings, we are driven by emotions, not by ideas. When it feels right, we do it. If it's just an idea, it is not enough. But something that feels powerful inside of you is going to have a very strong driving effect in your practice. So try to feel these things. Yeah? Know that they are true in a very deep sense. And you, when you feel that the Buddha was enlightened, the Dhamma is true, this is what gives that inspiration and gives you the power to, to uh, carry on and on and on. Uh. So because right view is so important, it is so important to always come back to these teachings. The problem with ordinary life and ordinary society, it tends to drag us away from right view. Uh. Yeah, this is all these forces in society all the time. People who think differently from us, uh, everybody is really out in the world to crave and to build things up. Uh, everyone is out there to use power or whatever. Uh, and because everyone else goes in a different direction, uh, you need to be reminded again and again and again just to stand your ground. And if you want to do more than standing your ground, you have to do even more to remember these things. So come back to these teachings. Yeah, Come back to them. Uh, read them again and again. Read different teachings. Uh, maybe next time I should do some different suttas. I've done these <laughs> suttas many, many. How many years have I been coming to KL? Five years? Ten. Ten? Since the very beginning, at Jeta one maybe. What I don't, I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. Long time ago. Huh? So it goes back a long way. Huh? So uh, <coughs> uh, and then uh, that is the nourishment, and that is that sutta we were talking about before. The uh, avijja sutta on ignorance, that the root cause of all of this uh, is uh, the Buddha's word. Yeah? You meet the saparisas, you meet the uh, uh, aryas, the true people, and then you hear the real teaching, and then the whole process starts from that. Uh, and if you haven't got that, uh, you are like the boat in the ocean. Yeah? You, are, you are subject to the currents and the winds and the ocean uh, and the nothing really to guide you because the Buddha's teaching is the only thing we have to guide us because delusion there is nothing to guide you and you have to rely on some external thing like the Buddha to be able to lead you in the right direction uh, otherwise we are like the boat on the ocean uh, the currents of samsara the currents of, s of society f make us move in whatever direction this, that society works uh, we are susceptible to conditioning from all of these various sides and we don't really know who to listen to, who is the right person. If the wind comes from the south, we go north. If the wind comes from the east, we go west. If the current drives from the west, then we go east. Yeah? These are the conditions of the ocean. We're just following along like a hull. There is no rudder, there is no steering mechanism, there is no engine. There's just a hull, just a ship, empty ship with nothing else. That is what samsara is like, and we're just drifting around and moving around, depending on the prevailing conditions. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Oh, 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 which way am I going towards nibbana or not? Not sure. Am I, is, am I going towards dukkha or towards happiness? Don't know. Sometimes it depends on the conditioning, and the conditioning will always change. So, if you think that these teachings of the Buddha are the right way to go, then. Uh, and this is your opportunity, yeah? this is your chance to use those teachings in the right way. And you can feel that they are right, because you feel that they are moving you towards something positive. Yeah, you know that. 
Look at your mind, how your mind is affected by these teachings. Uh, feel how it works, uh, and you will see that these teachings actually work. They do give result. They deliver, as they say. They deliver what they pre the preaching actually matches the delivery, what you experience. Uh, and this is the beautiful thing about these things. So come back to them again and again and again. Uh, and as you do that, uh, then gradually, gradually, this right view grows at the bottom of the Noble Eightfold Path. And as that right view grows, uh, what happens is that your intentions, uh, your ideas, your aims, your goals, your purposes in life start to change. Uh, yeah, and that is Samma, Sankappa, the second factor, right aim, right purpose, right whatever you want to call it, right motivation even. Uh, that is what that is about. Uh, and the first thing that happens is that you have more metta and compassion, yeah? Samma sankappa is not to have the viapada. Viapada is the ill will. It is not to have the uh, uh, vihingsa, which is the callousness or hardness or lack of compassion. So you have the opposite, kindness and you have compassion. That is the first thing that starts to arise because you understand the nature of samsara. And then also you start to gradually also give up a little bit. You give up breaking the five precepts. You give up being bad, yeah? This is the beginning of renunciation, when you re renounce certain things uh, so as to be able to be a kinder, more caring, more moral person. Uh, you have to renounce to be able to be kind. Uh, there are certain things you can't do if you're going to be kind in your life. Uh, so this is how right view drives Samma Sankappa. Your aim becomes different. And what is so strange about this aiming thing is that it doesn't necessarily mean that you become a very different person. Mm -hmm. There are some people who end up as monastics, and I think being a monastic is the most wonderful thing, but not, it's not for everybody. And you don't, you know, you're not bad if you don't become a monastic. You're not, you know, we're not going to condemn you for not becoming a monastic, uh, otherwise you have to con condemn a lot of people. That would be very bad if you're a monk to condemn so many people. You can't do that. So uh, instead, uh, sometimes it is more like you just, your attitude to life changes. Uh, that is really often what it is like. For anyone who is con carries on as a lay Buddhist, uh, your way you think about things changes. Uh, yeah, you again you focus on the processes of life rather than the results. Uh, you know that the results are uncertain. Uh, if you work really hard for something to build up Bodhinyana Monastery, uh, and then the fire comes after ten years, uh, and everything you were concerned about was the result. You wanted to have a monastery, then it all burns down. Uh, you're going to suffer enormously because the result was so important to you. But the point in that story is that Ajahn Brahm didn't really focus on the result. He built up Bodhinyana Monastery because he knew it was something good to do. He did it because it was an act of generosity. It was an act of renunciation. It was an act of kindness for the world. He focused on the process. That was what matters. The result was irrelevant. Uh, so when the fire came to, burning that, to burn down the whole monastery, he said, okay, if it's going to burn down, it doesn't matter. I'll just start again tomorrow morning. Uh, that is the power of changing your focus from result to process. Yeah? That you don't worry about the result so much anymore. The process is what matters. That is an extreme example. I don't know how many people can be able to do that. Uh, and when I heard Ajahn Brahman said that, I thought, wow, that's really powerful, uh, because most people can't do that sort of thing. But that is the right kind of attitude. Uh, ultimately, that's where you want to go. Uh, and then, if things don't work out for you in life, and often they won't work out. Yeah, you're working very hard on a project, uh, you're trying to make things come together, and the result is no good. Well, if you have put kindness and care and compassion into that, uh, if you have done it because you want to do things in the right way, with kindness, generosity and care, then if the result works out, it doesn't matter so much to you. Huh? Yeah? Because you have done all the right things, you have made good karma on the way, you have enjoyed the path there, you have feel happy with what you have done, huh? then you are okay. Huh? And then the result is not so important. It may still not be, not be nice to um, not have a good result, but it's not going to be so important. But imagine if result is everything for you. Huh? Yeah, and then because the result is everything, you even do bad things on the way to achieve the result. And then it doesn't work out. You have double suffering. You don't get the result, and you also have the suffering of not having enjoyed the path and having dragged yourself down in the process. This is what happens when the result is everything. 
is that we tend to do bad things and we also are distraught when the result doesn't happen. So shifting our attention towards process, this is one of the main aspects of Samma Sankapa, where we think about how we do things, how we achieve the process, that becomes what matters in life. And the actual outcomes, the actual results that we have, they are not so important. And we're able to deal with them yeah, if it doesn't turn out right. Samma Sankapa. And that process then is the process that comes afterwards in the Noble Eightfold Path. Once you have that right intention, the right aim, then the process becomes right speech. It becomes right action. It becomes right livelihood. You live with kindness. All of these things, you do them as an act of kindness uh, instead of having all of these other negative things. We talk quite uh, at length about right action and uh, right speech and even we didn't say that much about right livelihood. Uh, we could have said more about that, but that is really all about just having a livelihood which is not destructive. That's really all it means. Yeah, Undestructive livelihood, supportive livelihood, then you are on the right track. So you have all of these things come into existence. You do all of those things. You're now looking at the process instead. You purify yourself. You start off with always with the coarser aspects, the coarser problems in your life. That's what you deal with first. That's why we start off dealing with body and speech, and then later on comes the mind. So once those basic morality is in place, the basic kindness is in place, then we can deal with the mind. That is Samma Padana, the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, right effort. Yeah? We start to deal with the, core, the more refined aspects of our conduct, our thinking mind, how to learn how to think differently. Yeah? to think with kindness and compassion, give up the ill will, the anger, the hardness of the heart, the callousness and all of these negative things, uh, because it is so problematic and so painful. <coughs> and then you use some of the principles we have been talking about later on in dealing with those things. Uh, and then gradually you also deal with the sensual world, uh, and this is where this last sutta is so useful, the Potalia Sutta, to remind you, to reflect on that, to remember the limits of the sensual world, the problems of the sensual world, uh, and that real satisfaction actually is to be found somewhere else. Uh, yeah? And gradually your mind withdraws a little bit, stage by stage, from that sensuality. Your meditation deepens. Every time your meditation deepens, you see a new reality. Sensuality becomes less important. And instead, you see the beauty of deep meditation practice. Peace, contentment, joy in the mind, yeah? liberation from all of these troubles and problems in the world. You're leaving it all behind. You start to understand the distinction between a pure, beautiful mind and the usual being caught up in samsaric existence, especially the Kama Loka. You start to be able to distinguish between that, uh, and this is what this is all about. Uh. And then as you purify your mind uh, yeah, in this way, eventually, uh, as the defilements start to die down, uh, meditation becomes possible in a real way. As long as our mind is riven by greed and ill will, pushing us this way, pushing us back, back and forth all the time, uh, it's impossible to be peaceful. Uh, if you have too much desire and ill will in your mind, peace is impossible. Uh, don't even try to meditate if your mind is full of these defilements. First of all, resolve the defilements. Then sit down to meditate afterwards. Uh, get things in the right sequence, in the right way. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So real meditation only happens when the mind is already quite peaceful. Uh, and that is will, why you have, will have noticed that during the meditation, always start off with a long period of just calming down, settling down, allowing everything to come to peace. Yeah? Then go to the meditation object. Uh, because only when mindfulness is established is meditation possible. Uh, if you are going to be able to watch the breath, the only way you can watch the breath is if your defilements don't drag your mind out of the present moment. Uh, this is the nature of defilements that drag you out of the present moment. Uh, and then it is impossible to watch the breath except through willpower and that is going to be painful and counterproductive in the long run. Uh, so give rise to mindfulness first, uh, then you actually stay with the breath. Uh, 
and then you're on this magical journey here. This amazing journey of breath meditation, yeah? It's such a beautiful and wonderful thing here, where gradually you become more and more focused on the breath, uh, more and more giving up the defilements of the world. Uh, and this is this journey of purifying your mind steadily, steadily, steadily through meditation. This is the last stage of purification. We have already given up the vast majority of hindrances and problems in the world. It's a few finite, small, you know, granules of defilements left in your mind. Uh, now is the time to give that up. And that gradually is given up through this beautiful path of mindfulness of breathing here. And I love that sutta, it's one of the most beautiful suttas in the Pali Canon. We have kind of touched upon it very briefly, tangentially to the other stuff. Uh, and the stage-wise movement of the breath, starting out quite coarse, becoming more and more refined, going through the bliss states with the breath, uh, going to the states where there's only the mind left and the breath is in the background, and eventually entering deep samadhi through the breath. Uh, this is the meditation path. That is Samma Sati, the seven factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. That's what you have to do. And through that Samma Sati, eventually you reach Samma Samadhi, when the mind is fully unified. It is part of the Noble Eightfold Path. How can anyone say that that bliss is dangerous when the Buddha says it's an aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path? <laughs> it's madness, yeah. The Buddha, this is, it's not, it doesn't make any sense. It is part of the Noble Eightfold Path, and of course it is important. And all of these states of jhanas, they are just like that, that. They are incredible bliss. That's what they are all like. And this is the whole point of getting there. This is how you do it. And then, because you have the power of the mind, because you have the bliss of these things, then you have the ability to see things according to reality. Come out of the jhanas, it's unmistakable. You know what is going on. The deeper the jhana is, the more you understand what is happening in the world, how it really works, where true happiness is to be found. And it's revolutionary. The Buddhist teaching is radical. Yeah, this is one of the most radical things in the world, is the teaching of the Buddha. It is so different from anything else, so different from our ordinary outlook, so different from any other philosophy or insight or religion or psychology you can find anywhere in the world. Uh, it is unique and that this is precisely why the Buddha is such a rare figure in the world because to discover this truth is actually so hard. Uh, this idea of non-self is so counterintuitive, counter to what we think it is. Uh, and this is what uh, where this path eventually takes you. Uh, and that is why it is so extraordinarily interesting, it's so extraordinarily happy, yeah? It gives you extraordinary, all the meaning that you ever wanted in your life comes through this path. And you can feel it as you go with the path. Don't take my word for it, that's kind of irrelevant. Feel it for yourself. Feel the meaning in some of these states of meditation as you go deeper. Understand why they are really so satisfactory and so good compared to anything else. And as you do that, you will understand that if you keep on doing the same thing, it will just give more of the same. It's pointing in the right direction. So the more you understand it from your own experience, then it becomes really powerful. But that is the Noble Eightfold Path in brief for you. Um, a few years ago, I think we did the Noble Eightfold Path in, in detail, and that took a whole retreat. Yeah? So, um, it is, there's a lot to be said about it, uh, but those are kind of the main summary of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. So, I, I don't want to say anything more because, uh, but please, yeah, why in? Go, go ahead. Eight years, not ten. Eight years, okay, eight years, not ten. Okay, just to have clarity so we don't have get confused about that. That's good. So, um, anyway, so that is your summary for you. So I hope you are happy with that summary. Uh, and if you're not happy, well, that's all you're going to get anyway. So, <laughs> so please feel free to comment on anything or ask any questions. Why in? Go ahead, fire away. Cat counts nine. Nine. Okay. So more, more, even more clarity. <laughs> okay. Two zero one two. Two zero one two. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Eight, yeah. That doesn't matter. Nine. This is the ninth year, probably. Okay.
Also is everyone, everyone completely exhausted? Can't think of anything more? You just kind of mind is a blank, it's kind of <laughs> void. That's what happens at this particular point. So we have to have compassion. One of the things that uh, we should do, we have another 20 minutes or whatever, I'm not sure what we, how we're going to finish this off, I, but uh, uh, one of the things that would be nice, I think, maybe, is to if uh, people want to give some feedback yeah, on the retreat, uh, and because one of the things that we try to kind of plan the right amount of lessons, for example, per day, and one of the things that I'm so sometimes concerned about is that there's too much. Yeah, <laughs> five hours a day of teaching is like after a while you, your mind just can't absorb anymore. It's like oh, headache. It's kind of this blockage in here, yeah. and so uh, I sometimes I wonder whether we should. Uh, kind of reduce the number of teachings. In the morning, I find it's really nice. In the morning, the mind is kind of fresh. So two hours in the morning is no problem at all. But I sometimes wonder whether three hours in the afternoon, is that too much, Bobby? What do you think? Bobby has already some ideas. Okay, let's see. Let's see what's going on now. So charts, you have charts, cheapest. Mm. Survey, okay. <laughs> well, this is very professional. I'm, I'm super impressed, okay. <laughs> Do you prefer this arrangement of weekend surabit and weekday su weekday meditation? Seventy-four percent yes, twenty-five uh, percent maybe, and no no's. Wow, that's pretty pretty good. So people like this arrangement with kind of three retreats on the weekend and then more like a meditation in the middle. Well, that's great. And I, I must admit, I also really think that's a very good way of doing things uh, because it leads to a lot of flexibility and uh, to the ability to, many people can attend, they can attend whatever part they want, uh, and some people come on both weekends, some come just for the meditation, and there's a lot of flexibility. So that's a really good one. I, good, so we all agree on that one. Do you prefer more days with each day having less suttas uh, and more meditations? No. <laughs> the majority is no. Uh, 54, 55% say no. 30% say maybe, and 17% say yes. 42 responses. Okay, so uh, I don't think we, we, you will get more days anyway, yeah, because uh, this is the absolute maximum Ajahn Brahm will ever allow me to <laughs> leave from Bodhinyana Monastery. And uh, so I had to, you, you remember how hard we were kind of negotiating to get even this amount. It was, it was very, very difficult. Uh, so I don't think you'll get more days. You might get less suttas, but you won't get more days, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> okay, let's, the next one. What time would you like the first program to begin? And uh, the majority seems to be saying 8 a.m. There are some people who, uh, the, the rest of, most of the other people think it would be nice to go later. So you have 8.30 and is uh, the next group. So 50% are happy with 8 a.m., 8.30, uh, 33% and 14% starting at 9 a.m. Uh, and uh, yeah, so 8 a.m. is what we're doing already, isn't it? Uh, so that's good, uh, yeah. And there's some people, it's set 2.4%, they want to start at 7 a.m. Uh. <laughs> no more messing around, these are the real hardcore people. <coughs> It's probably one person, isn't it? Because 42% is only is exactly one person who wants to do that. Uh, you didn't ask him at 5 a.m.? You should have asked him at 5 a.m. as well. <laughs> it would have been more fun. Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, yeah. So that sounds nice, yeah? And there's a couple of things that I heard. I think someone suggested to me that maybe we should have some puja in the morning before the uh, meditation. Uh, and I think that might be nice yeah, for those people who want. Not everyone likes puja. So if we have someone like Aya Venerable uh, Punsiri here, then she, if she doesn't mind leading the puja, it's wonderful. Or even, you know, anyone can really lead that. I'm not a big puja person myself. I like to just give a short homage to the Buddha. And that's, I feel that is very nice, but I don't really like pujas so much. But some people really enjoy that. And it's not right or wrong, yeah, it's whatever you enjoy is fine. So we can add that, and then those people who don't want it, they can just come after the puja anyway, so it's not a problem. Huh? And then we can have the meditation in the morning here. Yeah. And um, so that I think is a nice idea. And uh, yeah, so a, s a few little things like that we can, uh, we can change. 
Is a tea break half an hour? Is that enough or should it be longer tea break? Yeah. Enough? Okay, so enough tea break half an hour because then it gets more compact as well. Yeah. yeah. Is it too much to have four sessions plus Q and A? Yeah. Or is the people okay with that? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Okay. People can deal with that. Okay. Good. In that case, we we will probably carry on like that, and then we'll make the um, make it a little bit less during the meditation part, and then carry on quite intensive during the the weekend. So people are okay with that. Okay. Good. Well, I'm very impressed, Obi. So, what is the next one you have here? Okay, next one. What time would you like the program to end each day? Some people would like it to end earlier. Okay, five o'clock or five thirty. Well, I think that is the good thing about the program we have now. It is quite flexible, yeah. Because one of the things that we thought was if we put the meditation at the beginning and the meditation at the end, uh, you can come to all the talks. Uh, but if you don't want to be there for the meditation or you have to leave early, you have the opportunity to go. The idea is to have a program. You come for whatever you want. Yeah, it's your retreat. You don't have to be here for everything. Uh, so this seems like fitting nicely with that program, yeah? People can then attend as they like. Yeah? Some people prefer more teachings and not so much into meditation, and that's perfectly okay. Everyone doesn't have to be a great meditator. Sometimes people just can't get into it for whatever reason, and that's all right. Yeah? Don't have to feel bad about that. Yeah? So uh, that is why it's nice to have that flexibility. Personally, I like to have, personally I like meditation in the morning because my mind is quite clear. I can actually get something out of the meditation. If I try to meditate now at this time, it's like blur, it doesn't really work, it's just too hard. But in the morning actually it's quite nice to meditate. So that's why I prefer a longer meditation in the morning and a little bit maybe in the evening like we have it now. I think that's quite a good way of doing things as well. So I'm glad. So people seem to be okay basically. Hey, come back. Thanks, Bobby. <coughs> Great. So, uh, yeah. Does anyone have any comments on this, by the way? I'm just doing all the talking. Does anyone have anything they want to say here? Sound good? Yeah? Okay. Good. Please, yes. Um, maybe not next year, but when you're ready, teach uh, us the Vinaya. Teach the Vinaya? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what we can do with the Vinaya, we can uh, take out some aspects of the Vinaya, yeah? And talk about some of the, there's some nice stories in there. And, and there are some, even some of the principles of the Vinaya are quite interesting. So we can look at that as part of maybe a broader thing or something. I think people may find that interesting. So, yeah, okay. Good point. So, uh, yeah. Okay. How do you find the course, course fees being charged? <laughs> okay. Well, people are really good. Yeah, people at 75% find it reasonable. So everyone is quite happy with the course fees. I have, I don't know anything about what the course fees are, but uh, and I don't really want to know. But uh, so uh, that's good. Yeah, that's uh, people are really happy. Some people find it is too high. Uh, but not many, it's only a tiny number. So if you find it is too high, I mean sometimes there are people who are young, there are people who might be in financial difficulties for whatever reasons, and then maybe the committee can give special considerations, yeah, if that is happening, so everybody has a chance to come be part. So uh, that is an important point. Okay, how do you find course duration. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, whoa, that, that is a really complicated chart. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't think I can, this, this chart is almost hard, very hard to read, uh, Bobby, I'm not sure if I can read this. Too short, there's all this, forget it, it's too hard, to, it's too hard, hard for me to comprehend this one. Uh, yeah, I will, I will leave you to kind of to, uh, to, to, to sort that out. Uh. How would you rate the quality of the food? <laughs> okay, so wow, this, people are generally really happy with the food. Yeah, I, from my point of view, also five star food. The cooks are really wonderful. We have some of the best cooks here. I think that's absolutely marvelous. 
And maybe, I don't know if I get a, I probably get a very special, you know, deal, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm super duper good. So people are very, very, very happy with the food. Uh, the, um, uh, one, what is the percent? Oh yeah, so 35% gives it full five stars, 36% four stars, and then 39, three stars, and nobody gives one or two stars, so very high speed max. That's, that's great. How do you find suitor duration during uh, the day? So this is 41 responses, four suitors per day. Okay, here we come, this is what I was asking before. So most people are happy with that, okay. Two suttas with more meditation. Uh, so there's less, yeah, less happy, happy with that. Uh, not sure if I fully understand what the various bars are. The so with the top one it says 36.6% Bobby. Uh, four suttas per day. Then there's another bar which says 34.1%. That's three suttas, okay, it just doesn't come. Okay, I see. So most people want four, but this th three and four is almost the same. It's very similar, closely related to each other. Okay, so maybe we can have four one day, then three one day, and then four. <laughs> anyway, we'll see what we, see what we can do. Uh, two suttas, nobody, nobody wants two suttas. Uh, and uh, yeah, my personal preference is to have a double sutta in the morning. I think it's really nice because then I feel quite fresh. And in the afternoon, to have at least one, at least one in the afternoon, and then maybe two in the afternoon. I think that is uh, that works okay. Um, and then there's all kind of other things, uh, but that's kind of minor questions. I will leave those out. Uh, would you prefer the organizer uh, serve breakfast? Uh, may need to increase fees. No, no, people don't really want that. Uh, <laughs> Seventy percent say no. Twenty-one maybe, and only ten nine percent says says yes. Uh, so uh, that seems to be fair enough. Uh, <laughs> okay. Any suggestions for suitors to be covered next year? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Ajahn's suggestions are excellent so far. Is one response? Four foundations of mindfulness is one. Uh, no, any sutta is good, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you, you might regret that <coughs> reply, because some suttas are, <laughs> are very interesting. Then someone has suggested Diga Nikaya 1. Well, Diga Nikaya 1, uh, this is a sutta I will be doing at the BSWA. So if you look online, you can follow the Diga Nikaya 1. Diga Nikaya 1 is a sutta which is quite profound, and it takes quite a long time to go through it. Uh, so I don't know if it is really suitable for this kind of course. Yeah, If you have followed online, I have been doing the Diga Nikaya 16, which is the Maha Parnibbana Sutta, and it has taken precisely three years to go through that Sutta. Yeah? 20 different sessions, so this one Sutta takes very long time. So, and that is because I don't do them so, so regularly, that's the one of the reasons. So I prefer to do things that are not quite so long, because um, it just becomes too much of one thing sometimes. Uh. Then you have uh, uh, someone suggesting the Diga Janu, Sigalovada Sutta, generally household or lay people, such as, yeah, such as us maybe, how to lead a wholesome and fulfilling lay life. Yeah, these are very good suttas, and I, you have a point, and I think uh, both of those suttas, I will take note of that, because they are very, very good suttas. Uh. Four Foundations of Mindfulness is also good, but I have done that before in quite a bit of detail. We could, of, co of course, do it again. Then there is a general idea on the long discourses. We did one long discourse this year, the Aganya Sutta. Did people enjoy the Aganya Sutta? Was that good? Yeah? No? <laughs> Some people don't, okay. So, a bit varied. On stream entry, another one suggesting Sigalovada Sutta, yeah, relevant to enhance deeper understanding. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Bahaya Sutta is one here, maybe. I'd let Ajahn decide, okay. <laughs> gradual training and skillful daily practice for lay people. Yeah, gradual training is one of my favorites, absolutely. Yeah. More guide to stream entry. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Uh, leave to organizers history of how suttas were passed down. Yeah, I okay. I usually talk a little bit about that. Haven't talked so much about it this time, uh, but uh, 
Uh, Satipatthana Sutta and Anapanasati Sutta. Okay, the so Satipatthana seems to be an interesting thing, so maybe we can talk about that next time, together with some of the more basic things. Uh, go with the majority, selections for practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay, that's all very good uh, uh, responses. So I will try to make a note of that uh, um, in my mind, and uh, then I will, I think I still have enough memory capacity just to, yes? Is the email to me already? Aha, okay, okay, good. So uh, that's very, very well done, Bobby. Thank, that's, that's really excellent that you did this a little um, market research. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> great. Is there one more? Okay. Okay, any comments to improve the quality of our Sutta workshop are welcome. Okay, first one, no, get more help from volunteers, is the first one. Ajahn Brahma's delivery of the Sutta is indeed excellent and very clear. Okay, that's good. Um, no further comment, thank you so much Ajahn Brahma, BJF and all the dedicated Kalanamitas for making this retreat a wonderful and inspiring one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Daily briefing of some simple ground rules based on kindness and consideration for others, i.e. walking quietly, closing toilet doors gently, wiping the water from the sinks, keeping the place clean, keeping talking quietly, helping with cleaning up, etc. Gentle reminders of how retreatants should behave and treat each other. The idea is for the retreat to move to be more than just gaining knowledge and also to be a platform for shifting of behaviors that a Dhamma practice comes alive in a practical sense. Okay, so maybe Bobby, I, this is for you, I think, yeah, to give a bit of guidance maybe every day. Yeah. Um, more impromptu Q&A opportunities. Okay, um, they usually they, uh, the idea is for you really to be able to grab the microphone at any time. Yeah, that's why we have the microphones on the, on the floor. Uh, it was supposed to be impromptu all the way. So just uh, don't be shy, yeah, just get up there grab the microphone and start talking here. And uh, don't talk too much, otherwise other people might be upset, but you know, find that middle, middle way somewhere here. <laughs> okay. And here, this is, a, this is a comment I like. More rest for Ajahn, half day break after, <laughs> after each retreat. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, we'll see how that, that goes. <laughs> Main concern is whether too many sessions daily for Ajahn might be exhausting for Ajahn. I totally enjoy this retreat, but I'm concerned about whether too taxing on Ajahn. Okay, well, I, my energy also comes from whether people enjoy it. As long as people enjoy it, then usually the energy kind of comes from that anyway. So then you are usually able to deliver. Ajahn's delivery of suit as well explained, clear and easy to understand. Thanks for the organizing of the members, for your time and effort. Uh, yeah, so lots of positive feedback. Uh, more feedback to gauge understanding. Uh, okay, so you want more chance to ask questions, presumably? Uh, maybe that's what you mean. More feedback to gauge understanding. Uh, um, some more discussion, maybe? Uh, yeah, I don't know how we can do that. Uh, we can uh, maybe we can have more group interviews. Uh, yeah, that's a chance to kind of gain more understanding as well. Uh. So uh, that's a possibility, and we can have that kind of squeeze that in somehow, maybe uh, something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We can talk about that later on. Uh. I have no complaint. The arrangement is quite nice. Thanks, BGF. Adam is a great salesman. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, I hope I'm selling you the real goods. <laughs> Reading sutta by myself is very dry and boring, but Ajahn makes it invigorating and relevant to my half-dead practice. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So hopefully now your practice will come alive a little bit more, then we will have succeeded. Keep up the good work, BJF and Ajahn Bamali, Sadhu times three. Heavy going, it could be better with interactive group discussion and then Q&A, okay? Uh, then we have some word, this is Chinese, is it? Gail, ge? What does that mean here? No, 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 I, I put a name. You put a name, oh, you put a name in there, I see, okay, okay. 
I see, I see. Okay, no problem, sir. Then there's no comment. Slightly longer breaks for Ajahn to have a rest in between the suttas. Okay, there's a lot of concern for my well being, which is very sweet. <laughs> to include open discussion among participants and share their opinions on each sutta. Yeah, it's not a bad idea to have some, a little bit of discussion perhaps, uh, maybe even towards the end of each of the retreats or, or something. Anyway, well organized, wonderful teaching by Ajahn with gratitude, knowing the theme of the retreat or the sutta covered beforehand will be helpful. Okay. That was what the book was about, but maybe the book wasn't clear enough or do you mean like uh, something else maybe we should have more structures so every day it is you know exactly which sutta it is maybe that's what you mean uh, maybe that would be helpful so you know which sutta we're going to cover that day we can maybe try something like that uh, more regular sutta is within within the year would be great <laughs> as Ramal is saying are simple to understand and easy to relate to a very good reminder on how we could incorporate these small act of kindness or change in our mindset or perception in our daily lives. So, so um, yes, some more sutta retreats is good, but remember that a lot of these things can also be done online. Yeah, uh, you have all the retreats. I have many of the retreats I have done here in previous years are available online. Uh, retreats from be done in Perth are available online. Sutta readings from around the world are available online. Not just mine, of course, but you have things from other people as well who often can be very inspiring and interesting. And then you kind of can make it up in this way here and see what you get out of it. You have tried your best. I'm I am appreciative to one and all. Okay, great. Inclusive of Pali text and booklets. Some, pe some people want the Pali text in the booklet. Too. Maybe you can have a minority of booklets with Pali text, like 10% or something. Probably most people wouldn't be interested in Pali text. Why, Yin, what do you think? Yeah, yeah not no. <laughs> For Miss Fine. You can make maybe a few more books with Pali text, then those who are interested can have the Pali text. Yeah. yeah. We could always repeat, listen, listen again to this sutta, this retreat, yeah. again and again. Yeah. You can, yeah, it's because it's very much the same uh, things. Uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's why, In, instead of going to a new one. Exactly, you can keep on doing the same, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, uh, there's no need for me to come to KL anymore, I can just chill, yeah. <laughs> just show me on the screen or something. Yeah. That's a <coughs> Oops, it locked again, uh, Bobby here. Yeah. I was too quick, too slow to keep it on her. Yeah. Um, okay. So, one more thing. Yes. Um, the person who asked for the uh, the Pali text, who is it? Okay, uh, is there an outdoor space for the participant to take a breather, especially on courses that covers many days and long hours? Roof, yeah, roof is a good space. I have been up there many times myself, it's beautiful up there. I go up there in the evening and it's really cool and wonderful and I walk up there and just kind of chill out by myself. You have the whole, on top of the world up there by yourself. It's very nice. Uh, uh. So I don't know, are you going to make anything out of that space yeah. in the future? Cover it up, Cover it up. okay. Uh. Okay, yes, yeah, so that would be that would be great. Yeah, you have this beautiful space up there. Uh. So that's really, really nice. It's a very good center. You have a very kind of diverse variety of venues and things. It's really, really nice. Uh. Um, balance content with reflection and practice. Uh some physical exercise in between, okay? Or light activities to break the monotony here. <laughs> okay, um, so this is about how to space it out and how to kind of ha make sure we have enough breaks and things like that, and it's a good point. Um, yeah, it is difficult because everyone is slightly, they have different feelings about that, yeah? So it's hard to really, for everyone to 
kind of be satisfied. And I think sometimes what you have to do is you just have to take charge of your own thing. And if you don't want to come for a talk, you don't have to come for every talk. Yeah, there's no obligation. And if you kind of feel you had enough and your head is about to explode and you need some exercise or something, do something else. Yeah, don't have to come for the talk. I'm, I don't count who is here. I don't even barely look at you. I, I, <laughs> I just sit here and talk anyway, regardless. Yeah, so you don't have to come. So just feel free to do whatever it is, uh, is uh, kind of, sorry Bobby, you have to come and unlock again here. <laughs> so uh, I think sometimes that is better because otherwise it is very hard to accommodate everyone. Uh, uh, better to kind of take that time out. Uh, next one, good enough, okay. Next one, suggest noble silence and no phone allowed during the duration of all the retreats, including Sutta retreat. Okay, so they can take that into account, Bobby, see what people think. If possible, retreatants should have the option to stay at the center during the Sutta retreat to avoid, avoid wasting time in traffic jams. That's quite a nice suggestion to have that possibility, yeah? Suggest to have a towel drying rack rail to hang towels for retreatants to stay at the center. Yeah. All okay, excellent. Okay, so that's very interesting. Yeah. And one of the feelings I get out of this is that people would mo want to have more interaction. Yeah, there's quite a few places where people ask for more impromptu Q&A. Yeah. So we should make it more clear that people are allowed to ask questions at any time. Yeah, we should make that more clear. Maybe have a sign or something <laughs> saying that. Because I don't mind at all. I'm very happy to have interactive. Yeah. And we can maybe also have more group interviews, uh, people have a more chance to ask, and when people come in a group, you can have more like a discussion about things as well. Uh, that's another possibility we can take into account. Uh, that seems to be the main thing that I get out of this. Uh, um, and maybe a few organizational things, but we have it all now written down anyway, so we can go through this later on when we make decisions about this. Okay, that's a wonderful, uh, Bobby. That's really, really great. You've done an excellent job there. So uh, you um, get your work skills, using your, your skills at, with your work to, <laughs> to good use. So that is, that is great. Uh, so uh, uh, what should we do now? Should we do anything more? Huh? Or are we happy as things are? Huh? Happy as things are? Okay. So then uh, I guess, there, are you going to have a picture at the end? Yeah, okay, picture at the end. So before we get to the picture, I would just like to uh, say thank you for the organizers who have been working really, really hard. Uh, yeah, and it's always a blessing for every one of us to have organizers who actually do this because they often do so much good work behind the scenes. Uh, I don't even know who all the organizers are. I know that Bobby and Lai have been involved. I know there have been some uh, chefs downstairs cooking away and things, uh, and, uh, but I don't actually know everything has been going on, but it's great. And of course, Wai Yin has been doing things and everything, and uh, Shui has been uh, su supporting as well in the background. So lots of people have been doing really, really hard work. And also, it's good to have everyone here. It is nice to have such a good atmosphere on a retreat. People are generally very, in my opinion, seem to be very kind and uh, considerate and there's a good atmosphere and that makes one of the most important things it makes the retreat enjoyable for everyone including for myself yeah it's like you're coming to meet your kalyanamitas so uh, thank you very much and maybe we will meet again in the future it's uncertain we may not but maybe we will uh, yes, please. Uh. Yeah. Can we acknowledge the volunteers? The please. Da you Dana team? Please, please do Dana so. Dana team, uh, Linda Wee. Yeah. Stand up, please. <laughs> Lin uh, Nguy. Who else? Are you? Evelyn? Your son. Uh, 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 Wayne? No, Chi Huang? Uh, Chi Huang? Helping me. So don't stand up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then uh, the recording. Sit up. Hand. Then uh, Ng Sing Chao at the back, my son, doing the recording. <laughs> all, all the YouTube, all the videos on YouTube. You just type Buddhist Gem Fellowship. It's all there. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, anybody I miss out? Okay. Thank you. Bobby. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, good. So uh, that's it, yeah. And uh, so, do you want to organize for a picture and things now, Bobby? Uh, is that the next thing, or? Yeah. Okay. So I can just I just go back to my room and I wait if we do get ready, and then we can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, that's wonderful. Okay. Sadu, sadu, sadu. That's wonderful.